Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions. And today we're gonna to be talking about maximizing the value of smart controllers. And I really like this title a lot because oftentimes we have learned that a smart controller is not just a set it and forget it tool. It's something that if you interact with this tool, if you use the tool and, uh, and take advantage of the uh, features that the uh, smart controllers have, uh, you will maximize your water savings. And so taking us through this, uh, this journey today is DJ Caldwell. And DJ is the regional sales manager for uh, Jane Irrigation and ET Water, uh, mainly in the Colorado, Utah, uh, Texas markets. Uh, the thing that I really appreciate about DJ and why I always like working with DJ is He's got a great background as a contractor and he's worked for contractors. He's also worked for distributors. So he has this 360 view of the industry, but I got to tell you, anytime I find somebody who's actually done work as a contractor, I really see their value in other places in the industry later on because our contractors face so many challenges, whether it's labor, which we were talking about before, training, uh, the weather, uh, getting jobs, invoicing. I mean, it is a tough job. So when I, when I see somebody who's dealt in that environment that is now selling back to or working with to help contractors uh, improve their businesses, I really get excited. So welcome, DJ. Uh, I'm really good, great, uh, great to see you today. And uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for the, the kind words and, and having me back. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Now, DJ, you just recently spoke at uh, ProGreen in, uh, in Colorado. It's really in Denver, but I think it was virtual this year. But uh, you just spoke there. You had, gosh, uh, well over 100 contractors. I know that wanting to learn about smart controllers. Uh, what's been the result of that? Are people excited still? What, what's going on there? You know, people are definitely excited. Um, a lot of the contractors uh, have, a, have a great, great outlook. Um, they really think that, you know, this is going to be a, a good year for, for everything, um, even all aspects. Uh, construction, they're hoping is going to come back roaring, uh, you know, even some smart controller installs and, you know, just general maintenance. Um, everyone's kind of, you know, gearing up and getting excited. I know this uh, snowstorm we just had kind of put the brakes on it a little bit, but, you uh, you know, they're, they're definitely looking forward to, to getting going and, you know, hopefully having a great season like we're all hope, we're all predicting. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we, we want to we wanna learn all about maximizing the value of smart controllers now. And uh, just want to remind everybody that I have both the chat and the Q&A open. If you want to type in any questions you have into either of those areas, I'll pass them on to DJ where it's appropriate in the presentation. And uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get going. All righty. Sounds good. Well, really, um, in my opinion, if we're talking about, about smart controllers and, you know, maximizing water savings, um, you know, one of the first things we need to talk about is, is the current state of, of our water, or in this case, a drought. Um, so this is the most recent drought monitor uh, map that came, uh, that was available last Thursday. Uh, they updated every, every week on Thursdays. So tomorrow there'll be a new one that does show up. But, you know, I've I'm religious at checking this. I always find it interesting, but as you can see, the whole Western half of the United States is pretty much in some form of drought this year um, or currently, um, you know, and it, that, that's going to lead to, you know, potential watering restrictions or limits on the amount of water we're able to use uh, for our landscapes. Uh, that's really going to be um, mainly in effect for, you know, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, all three of those states are, you know, 100% of their state is in some form of drought. Um, close behind it is uh, Colorado and Arizona. Um, both, of, both of those states are, you know, over 98% of their state is in some form of drought right now. A couple of things about this that I think is interesting, DJ. One, uh, where in the heck do you find this information? If I want to check it next week, right? If, if I want to get in the uh, Get a Life Club with you, um, where, where do I check this? You know, if you just Google drought monitor and then your state, um, it'll pull up directly to your state. Um, or you can look at just the, the whole U.S. map like I have here. Um, nice thing is on the website, you can click, click in and it'll actually zoom in to your states or to your regions. 
Yeah, fantastic. And then uh, it's interesting to me that you can see, right? I mean, exceptional drought, extreme drought, it doesn't get any worse than the exceptional drought. And uh, it's uh, really creeping west right now. And uh, in California, where I live, uh, we don't have any uh, drought emergency uh, tactics in place yet. And uh, boy, I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we're already to the middle of March. Uh, we've seen very little rain. And sure enough, you know, in about another month, it stops raining until uh, next year. So, uh, or at least till next uh, November. So this is very concerning. Anyway, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, it, it, it is concerning, um, especially if you, if you go back and you look at last year's, it's, it's mainly yellow and, and tan. Uh, there, were, there were very few spots of the dark red or the exceptional drought. So just what one year can do is pretty, pretty uh, impressive, actually. Yeah. So as uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, if you were on a few minutes early, you heard about, uh, you know, the snowstorm we just had here in Colorado um, along the front range. So, you know, at my house, we had two foot um, of snow in, in some areas we saw up to three foot of snow. Um, but here's a couple articles specifically on the drought. Um, the one on the left is from the Denver Post, and it talks about how even three foot of snow where we got it isn't going to be able to really help the drought. Um, you know, really, we needed to get that moisture up into the mountains, even though we're, you know, we're only slightly below on our, on our snowpack. Um, our reservoirs are, are fairly low, low levels right now. Um, due to how dry everything was last year. Um, so, you know, having all the, the snow and moisture down in, you know, on the front range is great for us, but it really doesn't help the drought um, or the conditions. So, you know, it is something to, you know, everyone cheers on the moisture, but, you know, we also have to get it at the right, right spots. Um, over on the right uh, is another article that I found interesting. Um, this was from the Irrigation Association put this out and you know, it talks about uh, even the snowstorm we just had, how it's really not going to affect us um, in our drought drought positions. And, uh, you know, down here is actually where I got the numbers uh, for, you know, where the states actually sit. Um, you know, both are very good reads if, if you can Google them. Yeah, so DJ, um, you were saying you get 23, 24 inches of snow just the last week. I, it, this is gonna help the situation, right? It'll definitely help us locally. Um, it'll put, you know, it'll put roughly about, I don't know, two inches of, of water down into my soil. Um, but it's all going to depend. I mean, we're supposed to hit 50 degrees on Saturday, which is a pretty significant swing. So if we get all of that melt in one day, the, the soil is not going to be able to take it all. So, you know, it is, it is beneficial, but, you know, if you look at it from a state standpoint, it's, it's not going to really help us out all that much. Yeah, we'll help settle a bet between uh, me and uh, Andy Bell and Gary, your boss, right? Um, who, how many inches of snow does it take to make an inch of rain? Or so take everything equal, an, I, equal an inch of rain? So everything I've always read and been told, um, it's really about 12 inches of snow will equal uh, one inch of, you know, rainfall or moisture. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so the 24 inches is really like a two inch uh, rain and uh, you can see you need a lot more of that uh, throughout the year. And as you were mentioning earlier, a snowpack in the mountains is where it really counts. If it's down low, it, uh, it won't um, <clears throat> evaporate at the right rate and uh, you just get overwhelmed. Correct, yeah. And unfortunately that's what we're gonna see. And um, you know, it, we, we all want it in the, in the mountains, but with our fires that we had last year in Colorado, um, that could potentially cause more problems if we got a four or five foot storm up there and it melted quick as well. Yeah. Okay. So since we started talking about, you know, all, all the drought and, you know, what, what could come, uh, it brings me to think, you know, really what, what is water management and, you know, why is it important to us? Um, you know, I, I think water management really is the, the single biggest issue that's facing our industry um, and even our customers. Um, pretty much everybody that, that has to deal, do anything with water could start to see some suffering from this. Um, you know, for contractors, I, I think water management is a great way to differentiate your company from your competition, um, maybe get a little bit more business. Um, but I've also started thinking about this in a slightly different manner than just water management. Um, I've almost shifted it to more of a, a resource management. Uh, we all know water is a is a valuable natural resource. Um, but if we start thinking about it in bigger terms, 
you know, all of our, our landscapes we manage, the, the crops that we're irrigating, even, uh, you know, our people that are working with us um, or we're working for, they're all resources as well. Um, so being able to, you know, really kind of move that over um, from water management more to a resource management kind of mentality can, you know, really help, you know, differentiate, differentiate yourself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I tell you, DJ, um, when I was at Valley Crest, there was a long time in which I, you know, we might put together an 80, 100 page proposal and I would sit there and watch a homeowner association boards whittle it down to a name and a price. It was like, wait a second, what about all that energy, that time and, and effort we put into that proposal? And, uh, and I would see it time and time again, go to the, just the lowest bid. And then they would ask the property manager, well, is this a good contractor? And they'd nod, yeah, they're okay or whatever. And low bid would get it. Uh, but when we started really showing the value of water management and we could be higher in the maintenance bid, but show the potential water savings or show them uh, HOAs that we actually save the water for, we were getting those jobs right and left. And all of a sudden those, that monthly maintenance didn't matter anymore. It was a total picture. So I love this idea of uh, resource management. Uh, and it's gonna get you away from that, um, that bidding situation and low bid and a uh, great way to differentiate yourself. Great, great points. Well, and I also look at it too, Richard, that you know, coming out of a year that we just had with, with COVID and all the restrictions, you know, a lot of these businesses have been shut down. They're gonna be looking for ways to, to save money um, and then you throw drought conditions on top of that. Um, you know, some of these business owners, they may not necessarily have a, have a choice, but to, to look to upgrade, uh, some of their, their technology, um, in order to save themselves some money going forward. Yeah, totally true. I like that. So, um, you know, water management, one of the easiest ways and really most effective ways is through the use of technology. Uh, when you think of technology in the irrigation industry, um, you really start to think more of the um, smart controller type things. Uh, you know, there is technology in everything we use, but you think, you know, you really think technology, you don't think a, a drip emitter, um, you think more towards the, you know, controller hardware that, that we do work with. Um, so I wanted to just throw up, you know, the definition of what a smart controller actually is. Um, and this comes from the Irrigation Association, uh, directly from their website. Um, and it says that a, a controller that reduces outdoor water use by monitoring and using information about site conditions, such as soil moisture, rain, wind, slope, soil type, plant type, and more, and then applying the right amount of water based on all those factors. So really, when we start looking at, you know, the, the different parts of a smart controller, um, you know, we'll kind of go back to the last time I was here and, you know, I, I talked about the way I look at the, the different levels of controllers. Um, and, you know, there, there, there is a, a vast difference between one controller to, to the next, but, um, you know, knowing those differences and really knowing what a controller can do um, is going to be beneficial moving forward. Yeah, can we go back to that last slide a second, DJ? There's something I want to ask you about this, right? So based on this definition of a smart controller, and I think the EPA did this too, but I know this definition was developed. Uh, do you know how many years ago? Unfortunately, I do not. Um, okay. I, I searched and searched, and I I would assume it's probably from when smart controllers really started taking off in 2008, 2009, but I don't know if it's really been updated since then. Yeah, so that's what I think too. I think it's a uh, more than 10-year-old definition that the uh, IA and EPA did, right? Because I think uh, if you connect a device to your controller that says, gee, it's hotter today than normal, or it's uh, cooler today, and it, and it adjusts the minutes on your schedule, that would be defined as a smart controller. Correct. And, you know, that, that really leads into the, to the next slide is, you know, you know, we have, like I said, we have the three categories here, um, but really, you know, in the category smart and smarter, you know, they are percentage adjust. They're doing exactly what you're talking about. They're taking a, a baseline program that the, you know, the user inputs in and adjusts it for the weather. So your minutes may go from 10 minutes to 15 minutes, um, but it, is that 10 minutes actually a, a correct number to start with? 
Yeah, so, so there's the first place, right? I could uh, program it incorrectly and it'd just be uh, adjusting off of my bad programming, number one, right? And number two, I don't, you know, if I'm putting down 10 minutes of water in your first example, right? 10 minutes of water, I'm putting down that much water because that's how much water needs to go into the root zone. If I put down 15 minutes of water, I'm just pushing past the root zone, right? I mean, I'm just wasting water again because I'm just adding more water that pushes past. Yeah, so you're either really pushing it past the root zone or in certain soils, you may saturate it and it just goes straight down the rain gutter. Yeah, so really, I don't want to be adjusting the time that I'm applying water. I want to be changing the intervals, the days, right? Correct. And, you know, that that's where the, you know, the next level, the smartest um, comes into play. Because really, you know, in, in that aspect um, or in, in this grouping, what we are doing, you know, at least at ET Water, is we are creating a new irrigation schedule every day for every single zone. Um, so we are watching what the what the water levels are actually doing in your root zone of your plant material, and you know we're watering accordingly. Yeah. So um, and then the other thing I think about, um, and once again, it's an old definition, and I, I appreciate that technology has come a long ways uh, in the last ten years, right? I uh, I'm shocked to think I've only had an iPhone for about twelve years. I mean, I feel like I've had it all my life, but that's how far technology comes in a short period of time. So. Um, most of the smart controllers really deal with uh, ET and that's what's happened in the past. And that is really valuable to know. But what I also need to know, is it going to be cooler or hotter tomorrow? Is it going yeah, to rain um, we'll, or we'll not? Dive in. Sorry, sorry, but we'll, we'll dive in a little bit to, you know, what, what at ET Water we call the predictive analytics, um, which is really looking at, you know, using the benefit of all of our, our weather data and, and looking forward to get the the, the best use out of it. Yeah, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, thank you. So then you did mention ET, which is, you know, really the value uh, for people that, that don't know, the ET value is really what is used to uh, make your adjustments. Even if you are using a percentage adjust, some form of an ET calculation is gonna be adjusting your minutes up or down or increasing or decreasing the frequency of, of irrigation um, that, that you may see as well. Um, so up here, I, I just threw uh, a graph up of basically what ET is or evapotranspiration. Um, the way I always ex try to explain it is, you know, ET or evapotranspiration is basically what the plant uses and, and what it loses or, or what was wasted. Um, so the transpiration part, that's the part that the, how much the plant uses and then the evapo or evapotranspiration, that's what's lost or wasted. Um, and both of those are, are key, uh, you know, knowing each of those, each piece of that is key to knowing, you know, how much water you need to put down. Um, over here on the side, I, you know, there's, there's listed four, you know, temperature, solar radiation, humidity, and wind velocity. You know, th those are all four very important keys. Um, but what if you could add another 13 factors of weather onto there? Um, you know, would you be able to get much more accurate in, in you know, applying the actual amount of water that, that your plant material actually needs? Yeah, I can see absolutely you would. So then, you know, the question I always get asked is, is really where do water savings come from? Um, I'm not going to dive too much into this, this graphic, but it's, you know, one of my favorites to look at where, or show people when we are talking about water savings because there are different levels, um, just like there are different levels of controllers, you know, you can get your water savings um, at, you know, let's just use round numbers, 5, 5%, 10% or 15%, or it could go all the way up, you know, to 50%, but, you know, it's all going to depend on, on the site and what you've had previously. Um, but I, I just think this is a very good graphical representation of, you know, the different levels that you could expect to see um, from your water savings. So DJ, I was thinking about this um, uh, ET for a second and um, you know, on your definition. And um, so uh, I, I was wondering, how do you get your ET readings? Uh, how does, uh, how does uh, ET Water, Jane Unity, uh, how do they get their ET readings? So it's, it's a fairly complicated process. I mean, we have a, a, a network of weather providers that we are pulling all the data for. Um, but the nice thing is, is 
once we have that data, it can be plugged into an algorithm. Um, you know, at 65 degrees, the plant is going to use X amount of water um, per day at that temperature. And we're gonna, the evaporation is gonna be Y. So if you add those two up, um, you, get a, you get a total amount of water, you know, maybe a hundredth of an inch of water between those two. And then you go to the next step and you 10 miles an hour wind, how much, you know, what was X, what was Y, and then the algorithm runs it through and then can kick out a, a very accurate um, ET value for, for your specific location, actually. So is that as accurate or as valuable as having just a directly connected uh, weather station to my controller? So I think it's actually probably more accurate um, than a direct weather station uh, for a couple reasons. One, the, the weather station that you're probably going to get for your house is going to be, you know, maybe upwards of $1,000, where if you're dealing with a lot of these, these networks of, of weather stations, you know, they may have 400 in the, you know, the Denver metro market, but each one of those may cost $40,000, $45,000, and they have a very stringent maintenance uh, requirement on them. Um, but on top of that, you know, with the, the network of providers, we have hundreds of, you know, meteorologists that are looking at all the data, um, and we're actually able to, to look specifically at your site through um, Doppler radar and satellite imaging. Wow. So I get all that, and that's all included in my uh, annual fee. Correct. Yes. Uh, and that, that's what a lot of people don't necessarily understand with, with Jane Unity. You know, we are now creating a, a virtual weather station that, that is specific to your site. Yeah. Because I thought about that too, because I think about some of these connected weather stations. I think, are they really collecting information on things like uh, solar radiation or percentage of uh, cloud coverage? And all this affects uh, uh, ET in a big way. Yeah, it, it really does. And, you know, the, the cloud coverage is, is a great example. Um, you know, that could drastically shift your ET value one way or the other, depending on if, if it's, you know, your plant material seeing sun or not. Um, you know, the other thing about, you know, the on-site weather stations that you may connect to your controller, some of them, you know, they don't even actually register the data and put it into their algorithm um, for, for your, actual, your actual site. Um, you know, at that point, it's, you know, you can look and see the historical and what the, the high and low temperatures were, but other than that, is it, uh, is it any more valuable than a rain sensor um, connected to your controller? Huh. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you connect the weather station to your controller, but it still just reads off of historical averages. So especially in this day and age of climate change, it's really not very valuable at all. Correct, yeah. And th that is certain instances. I mean, I I'm sure there are people out there that can connect them. Um, but the, the, you know, that is a couple of them that I do, do know about fairly well. Yeah, great, thank you. So as you mentioned, Richard, you know, I spent a lot of time as a contractor, um, then worked for a distributor and now with uh, Jane. Um, so I've actually spent a lot of time out in the field and, you know, I, I have seen a, a, a large amount of different things that, that can affect your water savings. Um, you know, having a, a smart controller installed is great, but, you know, you also need to, to make sure that, that everything out in the field is working properly as well. Um, you know, really anything broken out, out in the, 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 the site, if it's a lateral line, main line, head, um, all of those, if it's broken, it's not going to apply the water it needs to and, and basically waste it. Um, you know, really same thing goes for the misaligned spray patterns. I'm sure we've all been driving down the road and seen the park where the road are spraying over the road and giving everybody a free car wash. Um, you know, in, in that instance, you know, it's, we're wasting water in more ways than one. Uh, first, you know, the, it's going into the, the street and it's running down the gutter, but then by the time it gets caught, that landscape is probably going to be suffering. So then we're going to have to increase the amount of water to to revive the landscape. So really we're, we're kind of using more water than we need to or wasting it two times in a situation like that. Yeah, that's so right, DJ. And uh, it's one of the few times I can actually get people passionate about water management. You have to see it to believe it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, precipitation rates, um, if you're mixing, you know, precipitation rates on a zone, you know, dropping a, a pop-up head in the middle of a rotor zone, 
you know, that, that is a, a great waste. Um, you know, most rotors are going to be running at, you know, 0.6 uh, inches per hour on their precipitation rate where you're going to have a pop-up that's 1.5. So if your controller says to run it for 30 minutes, in all reality, you're putting 0.3 inches uh, or three tenths of an inch of water down to your, um, you know, to your landscape through the road, through the rotors, but you're putting down 0.75 inches with your, um, you know, with your pop up. So, you know, you're definitely overwatering, you're going way past the root zone or even runoff in, in that instance. And then, um, you know, Colorado and California, they, they've done a fairly good job of trying to combat this, uh, this, this thing of, you know, having too high a pressure um, in misting. So what happens is if you're running 60 PSI through a pop-up head, the water droplets become so small that they actually float off and they don't end up going where you're, where they're designed to. Um, so in, in both of those states, they've actually put in a requirement that any new head installed has to have a, a pressure regulated uh, head uh, in, in its place. Uh, so what that does is it brings that 60 PSI down to 30 PSI for a pop-up nozzle. So it runs in its optimal, uh, you, you know, curve. So we're actually getting the water to where it needs to be. DJ, I'm all for that regulation. I think it's a great one, but I think it's also important to think about something. Uh, pop-up spray head uh, in, in general, you know, a 15 half at 30 PSI, how many gallons a minute would that be putting out? On average, about one and a half gallons per minute. Yeah. So just think about that, right? Eight, eight heads is an uh, unusual amount to have on a zone. Uh, so you're talking, what, 12 gallons a minute? That's Pretty gone. much, yeah. I mean, it, it, it adds up quick. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm for the regulation, but man, uh, there's, there's some work to go there yet. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and then one of the other things that most people don't think about, but I've seen um, actually blow a budget single-handedly is the use of battery operated controllers uh, with the, with a smart controller. Um, you know, they're, they're great and they, they definitely have their place. If you have new plant material out there and you have a broken wire to your solenoid, you have to get water down somehow. Um, and you're not going to send somebody to drive out to the site and turn water on by hand three times a day. Um, but where they become a problem is when they get forgotten about, um, or the contractor just doesn't have the, the time or, you know, the want to go out and track down that broken wire. Um, so, you know, this little, this little guy right here, if it's programmed one time a year, um, that could potentially blow all the savings that the rest of your zones are, are seeing, um, through the rest of your system with the use of, uh, NET water or any other smart controller. Mm. So uh, we, we have a quick question here, uh, DJ, from uh, one of our audience members. And uh, it says, how often should landscapers check their systems for leaks? Now, it, it's going to change, right, based on the number of zones. And he's saying, I've got one place that's got 30 zones. But uh, how, how do we make sure everything, how often should we be doing this to make sure everything's uh, running correctly? You know, it, it, it really kind of jumps around. Um, you know, one thing you can do is going to be on the next slide with, uh, with flow sensors and master valves. That'll give you some information. But, you know, on average, I know here in Colorado, uh, contracts are written with either two times a month or one, once a month inspections of the irrigation system. Um, and I, I think that, that that should be about the minimum. Because um, if you don't have anything to tell you that you've got a broken lateral line, um, one, you're just wasting water and your, your customers, you know, money. Um, but it, it also, you know, if it breaks tomorrow and you were there today, it's another 30 days before you find it. Yeah. So I think, uh, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but I think the real answer is have a smart controller with a flow sensor and you'll be checking for leaks all the time, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So I kind of tried to lead in without taking too much away from this slide. Um, but that's really what a flow sensor does. Um, you know, it, it is really used to, to monitor the amount of water that is running through your main line at any given time. So um, once the, the flow rates are actually learned in, in the smart controller, um, you know, we are able to alert you once you have a, a high flow or a low flow um, or even a main line break. Um, so, you know, really, and all of that goes directly to your email. Um, on top of this, to take it to the next level, 
you're actually able to pull usage reports uh, from the flow sensor. So instead of waiting a month to see the water bill from your property manager, you can actually see today what, you, what water you've used over the last week or month or year um, to really dive in and you know, manage your, your water a little bit better. Yeah, so uh, a couple of questions here, DJ. Sorry to interrupt, but they're important uh, from our audience uh, coming in right at this point here. Uh, one, um, the, the question has to do with uh, low flow. So if you've got a trickling valve, it's going to even detect that? So it, potentially, yes. Um, so all flow sensors have um, you know, a minimum amount of water that they can measure. Uh, I want to say if you're with a, a two inch flow sensor, I want to say it's right around two gallons a minute. Um, so if you have a, a seeping valve that, that's running a half gallon a minute, that may not actually be, be caught. Um, but when you get down into some of the smaller ones, um, I can't remember the manufacturer, but they, there's one on the market now that is saying it can now measure down to, I think it's like 0.25 uh, gallons per minute. Uh, which is the lowest I've ever seen. Yeah, so they can really detect really small leaks and then big leaks they get, but how do they know that it's a big leak? How do they do this? So inside the flow sensor, uh, one of the ways is there's, there's a paddle that spins um, and it, it creates a, uh, a pulse that is sent to the, the controller. And the, the controller has to be smart enough to be able to decode the, these pulses um, that are being sent and so once the um, controller has learned its flow, that, that's key for a, you know, installing a flow sensor is getting it learned. But once it's learned, it can tell um, if it's normally running at 10 gallons per minute and all of a sudden, you know, it opens up tonight and we're running 20 gallons a minute, you know, we're over double what we, what we should be. So, you know, it would, it would flag it. And with ET Water, we'd actually shut down the zone and go to the next and send you an email. Yeah, so uh, with that, uh, I get an email. Uh, will the uh, zone just come on again the next night and shut down again, or what happens? It will, it will continue to come on um, until that, that is fixed. Um, but as soon as that high flow is, is found, it will be shut, shut off again. And then, you know, you'll get another email. So you'll get another reminder to, to head out and take a look at it. Right. So it'll keep reminding you as long as there's a problem and it won't run a full cycle. Uh, until you actually tell us it's okay, it's fixed. Nope. I mean, we're talking maybe a minute at most is what it's going to run. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, the other component that usually goes with the flow sensor that we are talking about, you know, shutting down your system is going to be a master valve. Um, you know, there's two types of master valve and normally open or normally closed. Um, and with a normally closed, uh, style of master valve, which is probably most common right now. Um, it actually keeps all the pressure out of your system when, when things are not scheduled to be running. Um, so if the controller does not turn the zone on, you actually won't have any water out to your valves. Um, where this helps is it, it reduces the, the threat of mainline breaks. You know, your system's not constantly under pressure. Um, but then if you do have a mainline break, either style normally open or closed, will actually shut down and stop all the flow of water. Um, so if you're running a two inch main line at 150 gallons a minute, you know, you may lose 150 gallons versus 150,000 gallons by the time it's found, they call you as the contractor, you drive out and shut off the water. Um, so there's a huge significant savings there. Yeah, I like that one, thank you. And then, um, you know, I really think that, that both of these as a, as a pairing um, really are critical for, for true water management or, you know, I tie it back to what we said earlier, you know, resource management. Um, it can really help people, you know, move the needle further, further forward. Yeah, so uh, just, just a point of clarification for the uh, flow sensor. How much money are we looking at uh, for a flow sensor? So it really just depends on the size um, that you're looking for. Um, I want to say a, a two inch uh, creative sensor technologies is really going to be under a thousand bucks or right around a thousand. Um, and then, you know, whatever size valve you need to go, uh, you know, tag with it. So installed, maybe a couple grand, um, but it really just depends on the, the style and size of everything. Yeah. And then how about the master valve? 
So master valve, um, you know, you can get away with, with using, you know, pretty much with anything you have out there. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people really like, um, you know, burr mods as, as a master valve. Um, some people even really like to use brass valves because they, they did, will last longer and they're a little bit more robust. Um, but again, it is, you know, all, all based off of, of size and, you know, how, you know, what, what it's made of and really, really how robust it's going to be. Yeah. So DJ, this is a ton of info, extra information I'm getting from my system, right? How many gallons I'm using, uh, real-time data, right? It's not, I'm not getting my bill uh, three months after I've actually used it. So it's really helpful. A lot of information. Um, do I pay more for my subscription if I'm using flow, uh, flow meters? No. So at ET Water, um, it's all built in. So if you have currently had an ET Water controller for two years, let's say, and then you decide to install flow sensing, uh, your, your subscription is not going to go up. You're not going to have any increased cost outside of the initial installation of the controller. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, that's generous. So then uh, we were just talking about, you know, some of the data you can get from a flow sensor. Um, here is just an example of uh, one controller here in Denver that, that does use a flow sensor. So this was basically a, a snapshot of a, a month of water use. Um, and if you add all these up, it's about 46.5 thousand gallons of usage um, that just this one controller used, um, you know, which, which is a lot of water. I mean, if you're, you're having to pay that bill, you're, 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 not, uh, you're not just throwing it over your shoulder and saying, oh, it's no big deal. Um, but you know, th this data really is, is critical. Um, as I mentioned, you know, and you brought it up too, you know, having to wait a month to get the water bill. Um, you know, with this information, you're really able to be reactive instead of, or sorry, proactive instead of reactive um, because you're, you're looking at live data instead of data that, that happened from, you know, from a month ago. Yeah, and uh, what I love about this too is that uh, it shows the manual usage too. Um, anybody who's managed water on an athletic field knows those coaches like to turn on a lot of water. <laughs> Budget busters. That's right. But then let's say you don't have a flow sensor. Um, you don't have the ability, it's cost prohibitive to install. It's on the other side of a road or, you know, there's a there's hundred different reasons that you can get where you know, maybe it, it's not the right spot to, to inst, you know, actually use a flow sensor. Um, we actually created a report that uh, I, I'm really excited about. Um, it's called our estimated water usage report, where the, the user is able to go in and drop in the, the gallons per minute that each zone is able to, to use. And then we will actually calculate a report similar to what we had before. Um, you know, I, I think this is, you know, it, it, it's the next best thing uh, next to actually having a flow sensor for actually being able to watch it. Um, you know, both of these reports could become very critical. Uh, last time we had severe drought in Denver, um, we were actually required to stay under 17 gallons per square foot of landscape um, in usage. Um, so once you have your total, you know, as the months go on, you don't want to hit your total in, in July and then, you know, fear of either being shut off or, you know, pay fines and, and overage fees. Yeah, so that's what happens if you go over, uh, you get a fee fine or do they, uh, or something else happen? So it just depends. Uh, last time that this happened in Denver, they actually came and shut your tap off. Um, so you couldn't actually use any more water. Um, but in like the city of Fort Collins, they just hiked their rates up to, to four times their, their normal amount. Um, so you're, you're paying almost 10 or 11 bucks for per thousand gallons of water. Yeah, I bet that was actually very effective and it saved them a trip charge too, so. <laughs> Definitely did, and uh, they, they did have a few upset customers the first year. <laughs> I bet, and, uh, and uh, they didn't uh, have a right to be upset if they're wasting that much water. Exactly. So then we get into, you know, really the, the controller. We've talked about, you know, what's happening in the field, um, you know, the flow sensor, you know, kind of some of the add-on stuff that you can do. Um, but really, what, what features does your controller have um, that can help you maximize your water savings and get the most out of it? Um, you know, we kind of teased it a little bit earlier, but the, the predictive analytics, um, you know, I, I really think that that is key when you're, when you're dealing with water management. Um, you know, knowing what's going to happen. You don't want to water today if we're going to get an inch of rain tomorrow. 
um, that that we don't have to pay for. The Mother Nature's given us for free. Um, you know, I kind of look at the the predictive analytics as you know, really all of this is is data. Um, it's all data driven. So it'd be like going out to try to buy a new car and not knowing the the price of it or how many cup holders it has or whatever is important to you. Um, you know, you want to collect all of that data to make the best decision, which is the exact same thing that predictive analytics do. It just brings more data into the equation so the controller um, can make the best decision for, for your landscape. Yeah, I love this slide, DJ. It really, uh, this is all the latest and greatest technology in a smart controller on one slide. And certainly if I was uh, selecting a smart controller, these, this would be the checklist that I'd be checking off. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is, you know, really drives me when I'm, when I'm putting stuff out or, you know, trying to get, get controllers specced and, you know, on a job, you know, these are a lot of the things that I, I really want to focus on to make sure that even if they don't go with us, that, you know, they're, they're getting the, the best potential water savings that they can out there. Yeah. We did talk about weather um, earlier a little bit as well. Um, you know, we talked about the on-site weather station, how, you know, it seems great, but is it really going to be the, the best option for your site? Um, you know, you really want to know how your weather is being, being calculated. Um, you know, a, a local weather station, is, is that the best? Well, if it's a half mile away from your house, you're probably going to get really accurate data. But if you start uh, moving, you know, 10, 15 miles away from, from where your controller is installed, the, the data is really starts to get skewed at that point, And it may not actually be accurate for, for where your controller actually sits. Um, and then we really dove in deep to the, the virtual weather station, you know, with the, the multiple weather source, hundreds of meteorologists, Doppler radar, satellite imaging, you know, all of those things can be calculated specifically for your site, um, you know, specifically through, uh, you know, that, that virtual weather station. Um, another factor of weather to look at is, you know, how many factors are going into the, the ET calculations and calculating the run times. Um, you know, are, are you okay running, you know, historical data only? Uh, do you want to use four points of data um, or do you really want to step up and get the most out of it and use all 17 points, um, you know, that we can pr provide? Next, um, you know, restrictions, I think, are going to be a big part uh, this year, especially with the drought numbers we looked at earlier. Um, you know, how are restrictions taken into place? That's something really important to look at with your controller selection because you want to make sure that you can go in and actually set the parameters for, for when the controller is allowed to run and how long. You know, you really want to be able to, to have a great grasp of, of what's actually happening out in the field. Then we move on. Uh, we did talk a little bit about the flow and water usage reports that you can pull um, and the alerts. Uh, you know, it, high flow alert will actually get sent to your email, but we can also, we also test uh, the solenoids. So we can test, you know, tell you your electrical health of your system. So if you have a shorted valve out in the field, you'll know it sooner than later um, by getting this email. Now a shorted valve is great because it's not running, so you are saving water, but in the, the long run, you're gonna have to probably put more water down to bring that landscape, that, that irrigated area back. Um, so, you know, that is something we definitely wanna, wanna try to catch sooner than later um, before the, the health of the plant material really goes down. Um, and then you have, you know, everybody's gonna have somebody that has access to the controller. So, you know, we can alert you if it's suspended or turned off, um, somebody changes the program from the keypad, uh, you know, we can send you an, an, an email so you can hop right in on your computer and check and make sure that that you're getting what you need. Um, and then we can also pull a couple different reports. I threw one on here on top of the flow is just the runtime. Um, so that way you can really see how many minutes each zone has ran. Um, you know, along with the restrictions, you know, the, the, the flexible programming options. If you're putting in new plant material, you're really going to want to make sure that you have the ability to easily program the controller to run multiple times a day um, to keep that new plant material going and really get it established. Um, so just the ease of that um, and being able to do it remotely. Um, do you really want to hop in your truck and drive a half hour across town to, to program one zone or, you know, can you just hop on your computer and do it right there? Um, you know, the, the, the trip charges, I'm sure every contractor that's on here now knows exactly how much it costs every hour that they have a truck out there on, on the road. Um, so, you know, it's saving you time there, saving you money, and you're able to get your guys out to where, you know, they're actually able to do a lot of billable work for you. 
Um, and then finally, the, the last thing, um, and this is something I don't think many people think about. It's the ease of actually disabling the smart function. Um, so there are some controllers out there that are push of the button. You can take it off and you're using a standard controller. Um, the one thing I really, really like about ET Water, um, and I, I talk about a lot, is that it is actually very difficult to, not impossible, but difficult to take it off of the smart function and, and actually run it like a smart controller or uh, a standard controller. And the reason I find that very important is if you bought a controller, Richard, and you were expecting you know, significant water savings and your contractor came out and was just using it normal, you know, you wouldn't be very happy because you're not seeing, you're not saving any water. Um, so, you know, really this is a feature that goes in to, to really help protect the end user or the owner of the site. Yeah, so uh, DJ, this is a lot of information, a lot of stuff. Uh, do I need any special software to run this? Uh, just an internet internet browser. Okay. And all, all, I... of, all of our uh, information runs through um, our, our customer website, uh, jamesunity.com. Um, and all of this information is available available there. And this, that, that's how you would actually run your controllers. Yeah, so it seems like it's got to be a real hassle to set up. You know, you, you would think so. Um, but it, we have made it very easy. Um, there's For every zone, there's about, oh, seven or eight factors that you have to enter into the computer. And then everything else gets calculated for you from that point on. Yeah. That's great. So uh, if you have any, uh, any knowledge of your landscape, it's going to be uh, click a box, right? It, exactly. You just go through, you select what you have out there and you're, you're off and running, hopefully saving water from the, from the moment you, you hit go. Great. Thank you. So then, um, you know, there are over 736 controllers that are technically EPA WaterSense certified. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you with one statement. And, and really that is that there, there truly is only one that contains all the features that are, are truly able to help you maximize your water savings and, and lower your water bills. Well, DJ, um, great job today. I know I came away uh, with a lot more knowledge as a water manager, and I really appreciate that. I know our audience did too. Uh, very informative, very interesting, and I feel like uh, everybody's going to be able to take that next step in managing their controllers and has some good incentive now to uh, interact with their controllers a lot more uh, regularly. So thank you. And thank you to all our audience who showed up today for us. Uh, we appreciate that. We, uh, we know how important education is in conservation, sustainability, and water management. And uh, we're so happy to be able to uh, spend a little time with you guys uh, on this uh, educational journey. So thank you. Please remember all our webinars are on the JanesUSA.com website under trainings. And we are also on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. So uh, you can check us out there too as you're driving around to your job. So uh, DJ, again, thank you. Um, I want to mention Friday, we'll be back with uh, Monty Teeter from Dragonline. And uh, we're going to be talking about how to actually run a mobile uh, drip uh, system. Uh, and, uh, and he's going to also go over some case studies, some people who have used it very successfully and uh, share some of their secrets with you. So hopefully we'll see you Friday. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thanks, day. Richard.